Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to the War Room podcast. I'm Jacqueline Witt, professor of strategy and the War Room podcast editor here at the Army War College. Thanks for joining us today. War Room is the official online journal of the U.S. Army War College, and you can find all of our episodes and articles online at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. Today's podcast brings us a new regional focus, Latin America, as we continue to explore the regional security issues and national security policy around the globe. Given the many threats and varied interests around the world, it can sometimes be easy to overlook Latin America in discussions of global security. But here, as in many other places, there are a whole host of concerns, interests, vulnerabilities, and threats, and responding to them often requires creative thinking and collaborative efforts. On today's podcast, we offer you a survey of Latin American security issues. Our guests today are Colonel Ian Lyles, who is Director of America's Studies at the U.S. Army War College, and he is a Latin American FAO. He also holds a Ph.D. in Latin American History. And he is joined in the studio by Mr. Eric Farnsworth, who is Vice President of the Americas Society, Council of the Americas in Washington, D.C. He is a recognized expert on the Western Hemisphere and a widely sought after conference speaker, media commenter, and policy advisor. So we turn now to their discussion. Hi, I'm Ian Lyles, and as Jackie said, I'm the Director of America Studies here at the U.S. Army War College. And I'm Eric Farnsworth with the Council of the Americas and the head of the Washington office. Thanks again for joining us today, Eric. I'd like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit more about your specific background and area of expertise. What what was it that drew you to studying and working in uh, Latin Latin America and the Western Hemisphere affairs? Sure. Well, I've been with the Council of the Americas for about 15 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in the U.S. government at the State Department and the White House and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, and uh, I started uh, in the early 1990s uh, when there was a period of real optimism in terms of Latin America. Democracy was coming back to the region. Uh, economies were growing. Wars were ending in Central America. The United States was coming out of the Cold War, as was everybody, and was looking to some of our southern neighbors for a new relationship. And it was a pretty exciting time, and it got me involved in the region, and I found that I liked it, and I was relatively good at it, and so I've stayed with it, and it's a fabulous place to be. Well, I agree. Thank you. Well, I thought we'd start our survey uh, of issues in the region with maybe one that is top or near the top on the domestic agenda here in the United States, and that's the issue of border security between the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, and maybe the North American Free Trade Agreement negotiations. So why don't we begin with the first part of that. What are your views on border security and the larger issue of U.S.-Mexico relations? How do you see that going under the new Trump administration? Well, border security is obviously an important issue for any administration. One of the first priorities, if not the first priority of any administration, is to keep the American people safe. And clearly, border security has to be a part of that. But it has to be done in a way, in my view, that is effective, uh, both from a security perspective, but also from an economic perspective, and also from the perspective of making sure that as much as we're trying to keep bad things out of this country, we allow good things into this country, and so we don't unnecessarily uh, restrict trade and economic uh, engagement, and that brings in the relationship very, very clearly with Mexico and Canada. Uh, These are fundamental relationships for us. They are important, uh, and to the extent we can build cooperation with those two partners, uh, in my view, we stand a much better chance of actually being successful on addressing the security issues that face our nation than if we have antagonistic neighbors who really don't want to cooperate with us uh, in the first place. And so these are issues that uh, we're grappling with now uh, in Washington and elsewhere uh, because what might be done for domestic purposes in the United States does have international implications, and we have to understand uh, that, uh, that other people uh, outside the United States are watching uh, what we do and what we say, and they will react to that. Well, I certainly agree. I'm sure you've been following the negotiations about NAFTA. How are those discussions progressing between the three countries? Well, the latest round in Montreal, Canada just concluded. Uh, They uh, had made some progress, and that's a good thing from my perspective. I support NAFTA. I think it's a a very important agreement, uh, although it's almost 25 years old, and so it can usefully be updated and expanded. Uh, Think about how far the global economy has come in almost 25 years. Think about the automobile you were driving in 1994 compared to the one you're driving today. It's almost like 
the two are totally uh, different based on new technology and new um, uh, manufacturing uh, processes and everything else, and supply chains have developed, uh, our economies have become very well linked, uh, and so this is an important agreement that has helped order the North American economy. Um, what uh, we're finding, however, is that uh, there, are, while there are some areas of agreement among the three parties, Canada, United States, and Mexico, there are some very significant areas of disagreement, uh, particularly on things like rules of origin in the auto sector, on things like a sunset clause for the agreement, uh, things like uh, dispute resolution. And this might sound somewhat technical in the context of uh, trade negotiations, and, and, and it actually is, but it does have real-world implications in terms of where people uh, put investments, uh, where people decide to hire uh, employees, and all kinds of business-related decisions. And so there is a real-world impact. The three parties are trying to work through those issues right now. There will be another negotiation round in Mexico City uh, in February, and so we're hopeful that there will make some real progress there. In my personal view, it would be a real setback for the United States were NAFTA to be uh, ended or abrogated or severely restricted. I know the political rhetoric, uh, but nonetheless, the economic impact has been real, and overall, it's been very positive. Okay, thank you. Let's shift now to another uh, major issue in the region, one that perhaps is not in the news as often uh, as it might be, but that worries many analysts, and that's Venezuela's slow drift into dictatorship and its worsening economic and social crisis. What is driving that crisis, and do you see any hopes for improvement in the situation in that country? Venezuela is a country that is collapsing, and uh, it is being driven by a number of factors, but the primary one is a government uh, that's led by Nicolas Maduro, who has uh, systematically uh, tried to dismantle and effectively has dismantled the institutions of democracy. Uh, Venezuela was never a perfect democracy, but it was democratic, and at this point I think uh, it's difficult to call the country a Democrat, uh, democratic country. The Supreme Court, the Central Bank, the National Energy Company, the press, uh, the education system, on and on and on has been captured by the state and has been bent to the will of the executive, which is to say Nicolas Maduro and his party. Meanwhile, the leadership has engaged in gross corruption uh, as well as drug trafficking. And so this is a country that is clearly on the wrong track, but the real people that are suffering are the Venezuelan people. Uh, it's a humanitarian crisis. Food is increasingly unavailable to many folks in the country. Uh, healthcare is uh, collapsing. And so you have uh, refugee flows that have uh, not just begun, but uh, continue and have intensified. So where do we go from here? It is a country that is in a downward spiral, there's no question about it. Uh, there will be uh, elections in April. The, the government has called for elections, but uh, those elections have been broadly rejected by the international community as being undemocratic uh, and, and frankly against um, the uh, will of the international community for a variety of reasons. But suffice it to say that that's not going to be the resolution to the crisis that many people would like to see. So alternatives have to be considered. The United States, as well as Europe and Canada and some countries uh, in Latin America, have uh, begun to employ sanctions against individuals in Venezuela. I think that's a good start, uh, but it's clearly not going to change the trajectory of the country. And so we have to find ways to really do that. I think it'll take a full international commitment. Um, but meanwhile, the Venezuelan people are suffering. Okay, thank you. Let's shift a little bit now. And I was wondering if you could give us an update on the hemisphere's second largest country, Brazil. Um, do you think Brazil's economy is now starting to begin a recovery? Uh, and if so, how do you think that might affect its recent uh, political crisis? Brazil's economy is recovering slowly. There was a recession that the country endured in 2015 and 2016. There was a very uh, uh, mild growth in 2017, and most projections for, for 2018 would have a, a larger uh, growth uh, number for Brazil, and that's a good thing. Brazil is a hemispheric economy. It's the largest economy by far in Latin America, and so what's good for Brazilian growth is also good for its neighbors in some way, and that's something that I think we can uh, 
um, look uh, look forward to for 2018. Uh, economic growth has political implications. It's absolutely right. And you remember the old cliche about it's the economy stupid. That's not just in the United States. It's also in uh, countries around the world. Uh, and because of the economic crisis that Brazil is coming out of, uh, there was a great concern about the ability of the political leadership to uh, meet the expectations of the Brazilian people in terms of uh, increasing health care, increasing education, increasing infrastructure, all the things that um, uh, citizens would come to expect in a democracy that's developing and, and heading in the right direction. And so that was something that has led to um, the impeachment of the previous president, Dilma Rousseff, uh, and the uh, caretaker government in some way of the current president, Michel Temer, who's not running for re-election when the country goes to presidential elections this coming October. So we'll have to see what the Brazilian people want. Uh, there are uh, several candidates in the running. Um, one is uh, the former president, uh, Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, who uh, is under uh, indictment, actually. So this is a complicated situation in Brazil. Uh, it's unclear how it's going to be resolved. But meanwhile, uh, a growing economy will uh, restore, I think, some hope and confidence to the Brazilian people. Uh, and I think, ultimately, that's going to play out in a positive way. Very good. So as Brazil as Excuse me. So as Brazil begins to resolve some of these internal problems, do you see them returning to a more active leadership role in the hemisphere? For example, could Brazil potentially take a, a more aggressive posture in dealing with these issues in Venezuela or other regional topics? You know, I think that's a really important and interesting question. And when we saw uh, when Lula was president uh, from 2002 uh, to uh, 2010 and then his successor Dilma Rousseff, uh, Brazil did take a more robust position internationally uh, and throughout Latin America. Uh, in some ways, it was at odds with what the United States wanted to do. Uh, that was intentional and it was ideologically driven in some manner. Uh, but having said that, with the economic crisis uh, and the focus on domestic politics, the country has returned to more of a domestic profile and has been less interested in uh, actively pursuing international goals uh, in Latin America. But that's a latent uh, desire. It's something that Brazil has always had, which is to play uh, a desire to play a larger role on the global stage and clearly uh, within Latin America to be seen as the leader of Latin America. That's problematic with other countries like Argentina and Mexico and other countries as well. But then the specific question of Venezuela is one that I think uh, we have to kind of separate from the broader issue of Brazil's desire to play a, a larger global role. And the reason why is because the, the Venezuelan situation is so complicated. And for Brazil to play a larger role, it would really take uh, some sort of direct action in terms of sanctioning officials, um, working with uh, refugees who are already across the border in Brazil, and doing some things that might be inconvenient from a historical or uh, foreign policy perspective in which the support of sovereignty of sister nations in Latin America really is the overwhelming uh, top priority for most countries in the region, and including uh, Brazil. And so that's going to bring uh, principles in conflict with each other, where Brazil uh, wanting to play a larger role to try to resolve the Venezuela crisis. Having said that, uh, certainly they can play a helpful role, and in my view, uh, should, because they, um, they really occupy an important position in South America and do have an, um, uh, an important role to play. Very good. Thank you. So we've talked about some of the problems facing the region. I'd like to shift gears here a little bit, if I could, and let's talk about what's been held by some observers as a great success story in the Latin American region, and that's the recent conclusion of a peace deal between the Colombian government and the nation's largest insurgent group, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, commonly known as the FARC. What are your views on the peace in Colombia and the reintegration of the FARC into, into the society there? Colombia is a success story in my view. It's a strong democracy. The economy is growing despite uh, oil prices that have uh, reduced. They're now ticking back up and, and Colombia is benefiting now from higher oil prices. But uh, it's also a country that uh, uh, did all of these things despite a long-running civil war with the FARC and the smaller uh, revolutionary group, the ELN, as well. Uh, and so the peace agreement with FARC uh, is not something that all Colombians have embraced. It's still in some ways controversial. It brings the FARC into the political process in Colombia, allows them to uh, have seats in the Congress and run for president uh, in Colombia's upcoming elections later this spring. Uh, and so it is a, a complicated 
updated, and it's also um, not uh, been fully implemented uh, across the country. But, you know, you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. That's the whole point. And this has been a process that has been complicated and difficult and deeply controversial, and yet the Colombian people have persevered. Uh, the president, uh, Juan Manuel Santos, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for his efforts, uh, has clearly made this his legacy issue and is committed to uh, overseeing a continuation of the peace process. And I think as the process is implemented over time, uh, the, the vast majority of the Colombian people are going to come accept it because truth of the matter is peace is better than war. And, and the country was exhausted and it was ready for peace. And I think uh, we see that uh, on an increasing and a daily basis. But again, there is an election coming up later this spring in Colombia, uh, and there are candidates who are actively running against the peace process and want to have a different approach. Uh, and so it's not a fully resolved issue. We have to see how it plays out in the months ahead. From my view, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a very hopeful uh, relaunch of the Colombian project, and I think it gives the Colombian people real hope for the future, uh, and uh, one hopes that they indeed look to the future and not necessarily the past to try to um, decide who they are and what they want to be in the, in the global economy. Well, thank you. I agree with you that it is a great success story, but as you mentioned, in some ways it may still be incomplete. Yeah. Um, could you give us an update on where we are in the peace negotiations with Com Colombia's other guerrilla group that you mentioned, the ELN? Is that, does that have prospects for moving towards a resolution as well? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it does have prospects moving toward resolution, and uh, negotiations have been underway for some time in neighboring country Ecuador. Uh, but there was uh, a recent uh, security lapse where the ELN took credit for, frankly, killing some Colombian policemen, uh, and that has set back the negotiations uh, quite uh, quite seriously um, you know you have to have two parties that want peace and if you only have one you're probably not going to get there and uh, the ELN uh, has gone through the motions and I think the question is do they truly want to have a peace agreement with the Colombian state if they do I think there's probably a deal to be had but I don't know that all of the ELN leadership is there yet uh, and there are certainly some who uh, by their actions are showing that they really prefer conflict to peace and so that's worrisome uh, but um, again they're smaller than the, F the, than the FARC um, they um, are uh, in retreat and the Colombian state has clearly um, shown no desire to allow them to continue as an armed force and so so really the ELN has a choice. You can negotiate peace or you can continue to get uh, harassed and probably killed by, by the Colombian uh, military. So it's their choice and uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. Very good. Thank you. All good points. Let me ask you about what you think are the primary things that we should watch in terms of Latin American regional issues or security during the rest of 2018. What developments should our listeners be particularly attuned to? Well, I think as Latin America overall returns to growth, you're going to see a lot more uh, economic opportunity across the region, uh, from the largest economy, Brazil, to the second largest economy, Mexico, and, and throughout the region. That's a good thing. Uh, we also have a number of elections that face uh, the people of the region, again, Brazil and Mexico, but also Colombia. Uh, also countries like Venezuela uh, are going to have elections, and some smaller countries as well. So uh, the direction that Latin America takes is going to be of course, up to the people of the region, but the region could look quite differently a year from now. Uh, and uh, we have to see where that goes. But I think the broader issue uh, is one that I've done a lot of thinking on and speaking on and, and, and writing on, frankly, and that's the role of the United States in the region. Um, and this is changing over time. It used to be that the United States essentially was the only game in town because we were the largest country, we still are, um, and there really were no alternatives. And so our hand in, in Latin America um, was, um, was something that uh, was stronger, perhaps, than it is today. And, and I think we have to recognize that, not the least of which uh, is because uh, Latin America now has alternatives, namely China. And China is playing an increasingly large role, particularly economically in, in the region. But there are some other issues that uh, border on the security uh, issues, for example, uh, in terms of public opinion and uh, 
um, trying to drive uh, various um, relations in the region uh, that are beneficial to China from an economic and security perspective. Uh, this is new in some way, it's, uh, or relatively recent. And so what I think observers should be looking for is, is the United States going to contend for the region? Are we going to fight for it? And fight in a way of, of, of partnership and trying to find uh, ways to engage with Latin America on a mutually beneficial basis. And so when we do things like renegotiate NAFTA, uh, hopefully it's done in a way that all three parties find convenient and not just the United States. Because if we take a different approach, Canada and Mexico and other countries uh, in the region now have alternatives and they are pursuing them. Uh, and the United States may be the, um, the most convenient partner, the logical partner, the preferred partner, and I think that's all accurate, but we're no longer the only partner. And if we're not there, uh, the partnership that many countries are looking for now is China. And I think that would be uh, a setback for the U.S. and for our interests uh, and for uh, the many uh, reasons why um, we have uh, developed a, a values-based partnership in the, in the region. So that's something to watch, uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, that the U.S. political environment will recognize that as well, uh, looking forward and, and really seize that opportunity. Well, that brings us to the end of our time for the podcast, but I think this discussion is really just getting started. You've given us lots to think about, so thank you for your time, Eric. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.